So we're reading from Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Leela, chapter 17, text 141. Okay. Good. Um, the loud sound of the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra certainly made the Kazi very much afraid. And he hid himself within his room, hearing the people thus protesting, murmuring in great anger, the Kazi would not come out of his home. Purple. It's quite a long purple. It's good purple. The Kazi's order not to perform Sankirtan could stand only as long as there was no civil disobedience. Under the leadership of the Supreme Lord, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the chanters increasing in number, disobeyed the order of the Kazi. Thousands assembled together and formed parties, chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and making a tumultuous sound of protest. Thus, the Kazi was very much afraid, as naturally one should be under such circumstances. In the present day also, people all over the world may join together in the Krishna consciousness movement and protest against the present degraded governments of the world's godless societies, which are based on all kinds of sinful activities. The Srimad Bhagavatam states that in the age of Kali, thieves, rogues and fourth class people who have, no, who have neither education nor culture capture the seats of governments to exploit the citizens. This is a symptom of Kali Yuga that has already appeared. People cannot feel secure about their lives and property. Yet the so-called governments continue and its ministers get fat salaries although they are unable to do anything good for society. The only remedy for such conditions is to enhance the Sankirtan movement under the banner of Krishna consciousness and protest against the sinful activities of all the world's governments. The Krishna Consciousness Movement is not a sentimental religious movement. It is a movement for the reformation of all the anomalies of human society. If people take to it seriously, discharging this duty scientifically, as ordered by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the world will see peace and prosperity instead of being confused and hopeless under useless governments. There are always rogues and thieves in human society. And as soon as a weak government is unable to execute its duties, these rogues and thieves come out to do their business. Thus the entire society becomes a, a hell, unfit for gentlemen to live in. There is an immediate need for a good government, a government by the people with Krishna consciousness. Unless the masses of people become Krishna conscious, they cannot be good men. The Krishna Consciousness Movement that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu started by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra still has its potency. Therefore, people should understand it seriously and scientifically and spread it all over the world. The Sankirtan Movement started by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is described in the Chaitanya Bhagavad Madhyakant, 23rd chapter, beginning with verse 241, which states, My dear Lord, let my mind be fixed at your lotus feet. Following Sri Chaitanya's chanting, all the devotees reproduced the same sound he chanted. In this way, the Lord proceeded, leading the entire party on the strand roads by the bank of the Ganges. <clears throat> when the Lord came to his own gut or bathing place, he danced more and more. Then he proceeded to Madai's Ghat. In this way, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Supreme Lord, who is known as Vishvambara, danced all over the banks of the Ganges. Then he proceeded to Barakona Ghat and Nagariya Ghat. And traveling through Ganga Nagara, reached Simulia, the quarter at one end of the town. All these places surround Sri Mayapur. After reaching Simulia, the Lord proceeded towards the Kazi's house, and in this way he reached the door 
of Chand Kazi. So this chapter is entitled Pastimes of the Lord in His Youth and we are seeing the civil disobedience of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Not only is He being disobedient but He's inciting other people to be also disobedient. And they are approaching the house of the, of the Chandkazi. The Chandkazi uh, is, is an incarnation of Kamsa. And um, he's working on behalf of the Nawab Hasan Shah, who is an incarnation of Jarasandha. So the associates of, or rather the, <laughs> those individuals who were present in Krishna's pastimes, they also they are also appearing in the pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. In this verse it says, the loud sound of the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra certainly made the Kazi very much afraid. Uh, and that's a good thing. In the purple, Prabhupada is speaking about the uh, leadership of the Supreme Lord. Under the leadership of the Supreme Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the chanters increasing in number disobeyed the order of the Kazi. Uh, so there's this saying, uh, let's see, if you don't stand for something you'll fall for anything. So we are disobedient. Right? As devotees we are disobedient because we stand for something. Yeah? You actually cannot sit on the fence if you have certain principles, then by nature of having certain things that you stand for, by definition there are other things that you stand against. Uh, because the neutrality doesn't work. Uh, so in, in Mahabharata, for example, that neutrality of Bhishma Dev when Draupadi was being disrobed was his destruction. Yeah? Because he had the Dharma, he had a certain duty. Your duty in this situation is to do this. Duty means that which is pleasing to the Lord. Because your duty is to do this and you don't do your duty, you stand to be destroyed. Yeah. The, um, this civil disobedience led by the Supreme Lord Himself is instructive of leadership. So, the Lord is not happy with something. And he is approaching, and he says, he hearing the, the verse says, hearing the people thus protesting, murmuring in great anger, the Kazi would not come out of his home. So anger is also good. There are so many things in our Shastra which have more than one uh, application. Someone asked me recently, they said, um, what is this point? They were asking, how do we deal as devotees because we hear from the scriptures that we are not the doer. Right? So they had some question around that. So my response is, no, you are the doer. And then their point was, oh, but the scriptures say that we're not the doer. But the scriptures also say that you are the doer. For example, if you go and rob someone, and you get caught by the police, and they take you to prison, and then they put you in front of the court, do you think you can stand up in front of them and say, that according to Bhagavad Gita, I'm not the doer, so therefore you should let me go? No, you are the doer. Right? When we say that you're not the doer, we mean you're not the ultimate doer, but the Bhagavad Gita also talks about the five factors of action. And in those five factors, Prabhupada translates a particular verse, he says, the performer. That means the doer. At the same time, Prakriti Kriyamanani Guni Kamani Savasya. Ahankra Vimudatma Kata Aham Itimanyate. Kata means the doer. Kata Aham. I am the doer. And that kind of mentality is condemned. Right? How does that work? So in the scriptures there are many things which are understood from different angles. Okay? So for example, you are the doer. That is why you are held karmically responsible for your activities. Because you are the doer. Yeah? At the same time, you're not the ultimate doer. Because whatever you want to do has to be sanctioned by Krishna. Even if you want to commit a sinful activity, Krishna has to say, okay, you can do it. Right? You want to go and rob someone, but you have to have your body functioning to move from A to B. You have to have your mind functioning, your intelligence functioning to work out how to rob that particular individual. You have to have the circumstances whereby Krishna doesn't allow anyone to catch you midway through the robbery. Right? And you have to have enough health 
that you can actually get away from the crime scene without anyone seeing you, okay? All of those other factors are completely outside of your control. Completely. Okay? It is just by, they call it providence, circumstance, we say ultimately Krishna has allowed, He has allowed that to happen. Therefore, when you get caught by the police, you are the doer. Right? But in the ultimate sense, you desired something and Krishna allowed it. At the same time, it's not that everything Krishna allows is the same that everything Krishna wants. Krishna doesn't want that the cows be slaughtered, but there are cows being slaughtered every single day on this planet. Right? That's the point. There are cows being slaughtered every single day on this planet. So he is allowing it, but he doesn't want it to happen. That means there is an exercise of the free will of the individual. But of course, at the same time, we will be held responsible for how we are using the free will. It talks in this verse about the loud sound of the chanting, and Prabhupada talks about the need to come together to chant the holy names of the Lord. What is the Maha Mantra? Actually, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is everything. In the life of a devotee, the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is absolutely everything. It is everything. The Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is actually the SOS of the soul. Jai Shri Shri Radha Gokula Nanda Ki Jai. Jai Shri Shri Sita Ram Lakshmi Nanda Maha Ki Jai. Shri Shri Goni Tai Guru Prabhupada Shiva Prabhupada Tulsi Maharana Ki Jai. The Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is actually the SOS of the soul. The, the, the so sometimes they have what we call a homing device, right? Or a tracking device. I was speaking to some, someone yesterday who works in security. He's a global manager who deals with security across, across the world. So he was talking about different incidents that he's dealt with. And he was talking about how they have technology now that, for example, on your mobile phone, they, have, they can have a tracking device. So wherever you are, if there's an emergency, they can find you. And he deals with, he's ex-military himself. And he deals with military individuals all the time. And so he can sometimes, if he has his people in a particular country and they're in difficulty and they enable the tracker and say, I need help, it's an emergency, he can liaise with security forces in, in whichever country, any country in the world, virtually. And he can, they can then track down the individual, go in, rescue the individual and pull them out. I see we were talk, he was talking about how the whole thing works. And the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra works in a similar way. In the material world, the majority of the living entities are fully under the control of the three modes of material nature. So they are being beaten continuously by the three modes of material nature. But something very powerful happens when you chant. Right? When you chant and when you establish that properly, it is like a homing signal. Not only the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but the Supreme Personality of Godhead and all of his associates, they can understand immediately where you are, what your condition is, and to make arrangements to pull you out of a dangerous situation. And that dangerous situation is called the material world. But if you stop chanting, then your whereabouts will be unknown. If you stop chanting, your whereabouts will be unknown. Then you can become fully submerged by the material energy. And that material energy is ruthless. The material energy, you should be very clear, is actually ruthless and will stop at nothing to bring you down. So the constant vibration of the holy names constantly alerts the Supreme Lord and his associates as to where you are and they can constantly make arrangements to bring you closer. Another way of looking at the chanting, it is just like you have the vehicle and then you have that which empowers the vehicle. Right? So you may have your, your Porsche 911, right? you may have your Ferrari Testarossa, but it means nothing without the fuel. Similarly, 
for all the strategy, all the arrangement, all the facility that one has, it means nothing without the transcendental potency to move that facility from one point to another point in the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It is a shame that at the present moment people think that work and service are the same thing, but they're not. What is the difference between work and service? It is one thing, it is consciousness. And specifically, the difference is between work and service is Krishna consciousness. Who you're doing something for, why you're doing it, makes all the difference. <coughs> and it determines how you fare in spiritual life. Because the potency of the Maha Mantra has the potency not only to attract the Lord's attention, but to enliven the presence of the Lord within your heart. So the tracking device has that two potencies. Krishna and his associates know immediately where you are and the situation that you're in. But the second thing, when I was speaking to this global head of security, he says that when they send people into an environment which is dangerous, they can track them by the road they're driving down. So if they're in a dangerous place, they know that the route that that car is meant to take is down this road. If they, move on, if they turn left or turn right, they move into an environment where there's danger. So the tracking device can see, are you taking the proper route? And if you start to deviate from that route, they can immediately contact you. So the first thing they'll do is send you a text message, right? Because it may be easier for you in that, in that foreign country to reply by text. If they don't hear reply by text message, then they'll call you, right? A similar thing happens when you chant. Not only does Christian and his associates know where, they, where you are, but they can contact you. Because the chanting enlivens the connection with the Paramatma who is existing within the heart of the living entity. So that internal guidance becomes enlivened. In other words, Teisham Satata Yuktanam Bhajatam Pritipovakam, the Dhami Buddhiyokam Tam Yenamam Upayanti Te. For those who worship me with devotion, I give them the intelligence. That intelligence is actually the voice of the Paramatma. The voice of the Supreme Lord Himself saying, do not go left or right, stay moving forward. Now the voice also becomes enlivened by the quality of the chanting. So, Nama Parad, Nama Bhashudana. Depending on the quality of the chanting, that also indicates the quality of the guidance. Krishna consciousness is a living theology. It is, it is alive, Krishna is alive in his relationship with you and present to the degree that you are receptive to him. Uh -huh. He's fully engaged in his transcendental pastimes in Goloka Vrindavan, but he is also here with you to the extent of your receptivity. There are these two things. There is a potency of what you are doing. Oh, there is a potency of the nine limbs of devotional service. They are independently potent. But there is also your receptivity to those nine limbs. So you can have something very powerful, but if you're not receptive, you get very little benefit. So it is incumbent of the devotee to constantly work on how receptive you are. It is good that people who are thieves or, or negative people are, are fearful. People don't like this. This is another one that gets devotees confused. Hearing the people thus protesting, murmuring great anger, the Kazi would not come out of his home. So the Bhagavad Gita describes those three gates to hell. What are the three gates? And greed, right? But actually, anger is also good in some circumstances. I was, I was, uh, <laughs> I was speaking to one manager. He's ex-police. And he, and he used to work in, in, speci in a special team. And he was telling me about crimes. And he said that what happens is when, the, when there's a crime that's been committed in a certain environment and no one knows who did it, what they'll do is they'll interview all the individuals who are present in that situation. And he said, what they'll, he said you can tell people who were implicated in the crime very easily. He said, you ask them one simple question. You say, what should happen to the person who committed this crime? He said, the people who had nothing to do with the crime, they'll be objective and they'll say, they did this crime, they should be punished in this way. 
He said you can immediately tell the people who are implicated in the crime because they will play the whole thing down. They'll say, well, you know, you know, I, I, you know, you should be, we should be lenient. You know, they, maybe they had a bad childhood, and you know, we never know what happened. And they're saying that because they're fearful that if they're caught, either the person who did the crime directly or the people who who were who helped that crime to take place, they they're scared of being punished. So they will always say that they always they will always give a response which is below what should actually happen. Yeah? So Prabhupada speaks here about the weak government. He says there are always rogues and thieves in human society, and as soon as a weak government is unable to execute its duties, these rogues and thieves come out to do their business. So actually, people can't place our movement. Why can't they place our movement? Because we are the most conservative. And we are also the most liberal. In First Canto Bhagavatam, there's a purple where Prabhupada describes the devotee. He says the strict liberal devotee. Interesting, right? Strict liberal devotee. What the? What does that mean, right? How can you be strict? How can you be liberal at the same time? Actually, we're both. You will not find another religion where you can come in and out as you please. And we say that's fine. You just also add the chanting. Yeah, you're Christian, that's fine, add the chanting. You're Jewish, that's fine, add the chanting. So liberal, and yet you look at our principles, right? You won't even, in many cases, you won't even find popes who follow our principles. Strict and liberal, because both things are necessary. So, there is a place for anger, right? Of course, people, oh, Prabhu, you're a sadhu, you're a devotee, you shouldn't be angry. No, you should be angry sometimes, right? Prabhupada gives the story in fourth canto, uh, Narada Muni and the snake. How many of you heard the story? Yeah, so everyone's heard the story. In other words, things are context specific. The devotee should not be angry. However, for establishing proper standard, you should be angry. Right? Because if you don't, then people in lower consciousness, they will do the wrong thing and they will act as if it's okay. And then what follows later is other people who have, the, who have the good and bad existing within them. In other words, the general populace of conditioned living entities who have the good dog and the bad dog fighting through supremacy. When they see that low standards are accepted, what happens to the standard? Everyone knows it goes down. Right? It does not take a rocket scientist to understand this very simple fact of human psychology. So when you allow deviation and you do not address deviation, you allow an animalistic culture to pervade. No one should be under any illusion about that. Huh? And that is how we've got to the present situation. And it's very interesting. If people, if people abuse other individuals, they may get a certain sentence. If people steal your property, oh my God, then the sentence usually is much greater. So what message does that send about what is valued in, in the present human society? Think about it. What's the answer? Things are valued over people. And unfortunately, because we come in as conditioned souls into the movement, we can also sometimes bring that same material, materialistic mentality into the association of Vaishnavas. So we have to be very careful. Now sometimes it becomes difficult because if we're not trained, we may justify all kinds of deviation and say, well, it's for a higher purpose, we're spreading the mission. But we are all ultimately trying to create a community. Hmm? The entire purpose of all the facility in Krishna consciousness, the entire purpose of all the projects in Krishna consciousness is for the devotees. The devotees are not the medium of the service, they are the goal of the service. You understand? It's not that we use devotees to get things done. We are getting things done for the pleasure of and for the service of the Vaishnavas. Be very careful not to get the two things mixed up. We are engaging at, in, in facility and we are also engaging devotees in service for the pleasure of the Vaishnavas. And of the Vaishnavas, we're doing it for the pleasure of our founder Acharya Shri Prabhupada. So it's not that, the, it's not that you, have, you can just do anything and, and say that in the name of Krishna consciousness, let us allow the deviation. Because what happens is you destroy the culture. Prabhupada talks about the culture of love and trust, but that means you have to be trustworthy. Otherwise, in the short term you gain, 
and in the long term you lose. Huh? So you can look at leadership in different modes. Right? You can look at leadership in different modes. Is it something that has a short-term gain but that destroys the culture, destroys the trust in the longer term? That means your leadership is in the mode of what? What, have, what does Krishna say? What, what mode begins like nectar? So give something in the short term and causes trouble in the longer term. Passion. Right? So devotional service in the mode of passion is like that. Yeah? Leadership in the mode of passion is like that. We gain something. But because of the way you did it, because of the deviation that you've allowed, now no one trusts you. Your name is like rubbish. It's like mud. And then for, therefore, very interesting, if you look at this with purple, what does Prabhupada say? Uh -huh. There's a specific statement that Prabhupada makes here about, ah, here it is. There are always rogues and thieves in human society, and as soon as the weak government is unable to execute its duties, these rogues and thieves come out to do their business. Thus, and this is very interesting, thus the entire society becomes a hell unfit for gentlemen to live in. You will even see in our spiritual communities sometimes, people who are very political, they don't mind hanging around in a political environment. But people who are not political, they just think this is, this is animalistic, let's go somewhere else. Yeah? It's very, very interesting because different psychology or different consciousness thrive in different environments. You understand? Yeah? So if it's an animalistic environment, people who are animals, they don't mind hanging out there. But if you're trying to get people who are more refined, that completely puts them off. And they'll think, this is, this is horrible. Just look at the quality of these people. We, sh we should go somewhere else. Right? Just look at the low consciousness of these people. It's very interesting in the Mahabharat. When Karna was trying to fix his, um, his... The wheel had come off his chariot. So he was telling... Who was he fighting? Arjun. He said, wait, let me, re let me put the, the, um, the wheel on the chariot. It's Shatri code, right? You shouldn't attack me when, I'm, you know, when my back is turned. What was Krishna's advice to Arjun? And what was his justification? Sorry? Yeah, he, acted, he didn't act according to Dharma before. Right? Dharma is actually the platform of human life. Right? Anamoy is the mode of ignorance. Pranamoy is the mode of passion. Manamoy. Mana means mind. Dharma is on the platform of Manamoy. Manamoy means the mode of goodness. Prabhupada will often speak about people who are less than animals or who are less than human, let's say. Yeah? Manamoy relates to Dharma. It's the mode of goodness. Vaishnavas are meant to work out of the mode of goodness. It is just that in Kali Yuga, because it's such a fallen consciousness, we're struggling even to get into the mode of goodness. What to speak of working out of it. So you'll see all kinds of crazy nonsense going on in the name of devotional service. Yeah. Brace yourself. So navigating around that is, is the science of Krishna consciousness. And that is why Prabhupada makes an, another very powerful point here. He talks about applying Krishna consciousness scientifically. Huh? And, you talk, and, he, and he says here about us, he says that we are not. Let me read you the exact sentence. The Krishna consciousness movement is not a sentimental religious movement. It is a movement for the reformation of all the anomalies of human society. You cannot afford to be sentimental in this movement, ladies and gentlemen. Because if you are sentimental in this movement, I will beat you like you've never been beaten before. Right? Straight up. Yeah? You cannot look, so you have to know what is the standard, who am I dealing with, and how do we deal with people who are often not necessarily acting properly. Does this sound familiar? Okay, let's be real about it. That's how it is. So the Krishna consciousness movement, Prabhupada says, is like the hospital. And just like the hospital, you're going to meet a lot of sick people. Right? And the reason why we have to also be compassionate to those sick people is because you are also in the hospital because you're also what? You're also sick. But the one thing to bear in mind, try not to catch any diseases from the other people in the, in the hospital. You get the point? Yeah. Try and make sure that you're taking your medicine and if they've got a contagious disease and they've been told to stay in one of the wards which are, which are cordoned off of the contagious disease, don't go visiting the other sick people in that area. Unless you're the doctor, unless you're immune to that disease, and unless you can bring that person up. Yeah? 
It is, it is so scientific that you might just miss it. The tendency is to Kanish, the Adhikari, is you come into the movement and everyone's a pure devotee. Everyone's a pure devotee, right? You know how I know they're a pure devotee? Because they smiled at me, right? That's how I know they're a pure devotee. No, it doesn't work that way. Yeah? Everyone is meant to be understood for who they are. Therefore, we are judgmental. People don't like this also because it's not politica politically correct. And people don't like it. The people who dislike it the most are people who behave badly. Right? Because if you talk about being judgmental, they're scared that you're going to turn around and say, look, what the hell do you think you're doing? You can't behave like that. Stop it. And they don't want anyone to tell them that they're doing something wrong. Right? So therefore, there's a way of cheating by, you, by misusing the Shastra and, and kind of playing down something. There's an idea, they call it game theory. Game theory means that we'll tell everyone that we should be pious and forgiving. Because if you're pious and forgiving and I rob you, then, then, you, then, you'll, be, then you'll be lenient on me, right? Because after all, we established we should be pious and forgiving. So it's a way of cheating. Yeah? We should apply the teachings properly, both to ourselves and to others. Yeah? Of course, really, you can't cheat anyone. Because if you cheat anyone, Krishna's just gonna, he's gonna slam dunk you. Right? It's just a question of time. You sometimes see people behaving badly and you think nothing seems to be happening to them. No, just give it time. Right? Actually what happens is in some cases Krishna will allow someone to do something wrong for a long period because their internal desire is to really do, cause trouble. You really want to cause trouble in the movement? You really want to cheat continuously? You want to be a serial cheat? No problem. I won't give you a reaction for a long time because that way you can really feel that you're cheating people and nothing's happening to you, you're getting away with it. And then at some point, bang, you get something very intense. And where do we get that from? Look at the Mahabharata. It's not just one attempt on the Pandavas. Right? And they're not, they're not, they're not sadhakas. Pandavas, the Pandavas are not sadhakas. They're, they're Nitya Siddha Mahabhagava devotees of the Lord. Do you understand? It doesn't get higher than that. Right? And even in terms of their pastimes on the earth, you have, you have Yudhisthi who is, who is Dharma personified, right? He's not like, you know, a nice guy. He's Dharma personified. <laughs> you understand? Right? So various attempts. House of Lack. You know, all kinds of things. Losing their entire kingdom. Draupadi is being disrobed. I mean, you may disrobe someone's wife and the person's, you know, upset. But you disrobe a Kshatriya's wife, right? Five Kshatriyas who are royalty and in positions of power, you're in trouble, right? At that, so up until that particular point, the Pandavas had tolerated everything. That tolerance comes because they were trained by Brahmanas. The Brahmanas will tolerate literally too much. But at a certain point, it's like, dude, okay, we're going, we're going away, but when we come back, we're going to kill all of you, right? So Shikuni knew that that was the one thing that would cause the Pandavas to lose, to basically lose it. They tolerated so much, okay, just give us five villages, I know you like this, you like that, okay. But when Draupadi is disrobed, okay, that's the end of the story. We're going away, when we come back, you're as good as dead. Uh, so there is a limit to tolerance, but for a higher purpose. You should actually be tolerant. But tolerance doesn't mean that the devotee doesn't respond. Now it gets more scientific than that. At the same time, you respond according to your position, right? So Bhishma Dev, when Draupadi is being disrobed, He's an elder. It's his job to respond. The juniors, it's not their job to respond. Their juniors is their job to turn to the elder and say, mm, I don't think this is the right thing to go to do. I'm going to leave it with you because you're in a position where you're meant to deal with this. Right? So everyone has a different dharma. That's where it gets scientific. Right? Scientific means, what is my dharma in this situation? Huh? That is the point. And if you play your role properly, Krishna consciousness will rock for you. I mean, it's, the truth of the matter is, anyone who practices Krishna consciousness, you are incredibly fortunate. This Maha Mantra, it will take you from A back to the spiritual world. It will take you all the way back and it will take you in style. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? You may think that you, as, as a practicing devotee, that different things happen to you. But you know what? Everything that happens to you, if you're falling properly, is incredibly auspicious. Even the bad, even the so-called bad things, incredibly auspicious, right? There's nothing that happens in the life of a devotee that is not auspicious, and I'm talking all capitals, yeah? You may not understand at the time how it's auspicious, but believe you me, it is always auspicious. Yeah? 
because there's always some golden nugget, there's always some special blessing, empowerment, strength, insight, there's always something. You have to look for it. You have to have the vision to understand what is Krishna trying to teach you. Therefore, there, there, are, there are two questions in a, that's front of mind for the devotee in good times and in bad times. The first question is, what does, Krishna, what does Krishna want me to understand from this experience? That is question number one. Question number two, how does Krishna want me to respond in this situation? Okay? These two questions. What is Krishna trying to teach me? There's a language. It's a love language. It's a love language that is specifically between you and the Supreme Personality of God, and that language is always being spoken. That language is always, always being spoken. Yeah? What, what does Krishna want me to learn from this experience? Question number one. Question number two. How does Krishna want me to respond in this situation? If you constantly have that meditation, you will, you will drink nectar at every step of your spiritual life. And in good association, the answers to these questions become more and more clarified. Sometimes Krishna just show you, dude, why are you hanging around with these people? You know, they don't, just look at these people, just look at the type of people you're around. You should, why don't you stop hanging around with these people and hang around with these people? You'll, get, you'll make much more spiritual progress. They're not doing anything for you. Right? Krishna consciousness is, 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 it mirrors the way that Krishna deals. You're meant to mirror. Yeyep Taman Prapadyante means that when you care about Krishna, Krishna cares about, he reciprocates with you, right? When I say care here, it doesn't mean the ultimate sense. Krishna always cares. But you're prepared to be a devotee in service. He's going to give himself to you. He's going to reveal himself to you, right? As all surrender unto me, I do what? What does he say? I reward them all accordingly, right? That is the nature of relationship, right? And if you don't care, Christian becomes neutral. Okay, you want to do your own thing? Cool. I'm in the spiritual world. When you're ready, we can talk about it. Right? That's how it works. So it is meant to be that type of understanding. Our, our teachings are, also, are actually the science of Ras Tattva. It is literally the scientific understanding and application of relationships. And if you do not apply it scientifically, you're not going anywhere. So in Krishna consciousness, stay awake and avoid being sentimental. Because if you avoid being sentimental, okay, I get it. This is a devotee, but actually they're in lower consciousness. Let's be very honest. Oh, but Prabhu, we're being offended. No, no, it's called discrimination, right? Offensive is when you have a malicious or negative mentality towards another devotee. But the recognition of where someone is, Kanishta, Madhyam, Uttama, and the proper dealing with them according to their actual level of consciousness, that is called scientific application of Krishna consciousness. Yeah? So people say don't be judgmental, but that's a judgment. Think about it, right? You sh devotee shouldn't be judgmental. That means that my judgment is that you being judgmental is wrong, which is a judgment. Yeah? So it's kind of cheating. Right, but it's a very clever way of cheating. <laughs> so in the, in the Shastra, they, there's a thing. See, that there's different approaches in the Shastra. Dharma relates to the mode of goodness. Then there's Sanatana Dharma, which relates to Shuddha Sattva. That's what we're meant to be practicing. That's the platform we're meant to come to. But there's a platform below Dharma, which is where people can, be, can do things which are very clever in the short term. And, and that type of approach that is the type of approach that Dewey Yodin used. So it actually does work. Right? Understand that. That approach that Dewey Yodin used, it does work. But it works only over a given duration. So for example, when Dewey Yodin saw Karna's ability and he immediately you know, brought, brought Karma in by giving him a certain level of you know, position, that's actually using a very clever approach. It works. That approach, according to Shastra, is based upon the modes of passion and ignorance. You okay? No, it's okay. That approach, that kind of very clever approach, 
is brilliant in the short term, but all it does is it creates longer term difficulty. Right? Think about it. We see the reflection in the material world. So you have a business and you create a product and that product isn't really high quality, but it looks great. So people, and it looks cheap and it looks attractive. So in the short term, what do people do with your product? Buy or not buy? Buy. And when they see in the longer term that the quality of your product is rubbish, what happens to the reputation of your, of your company? It's destroyed. Yeah. So Dharma works in, so each mode actually works according to a certain duration. Right? So that's why when you see things done in lower modes and you think, oh, but they seem to be okay, they seem to get, no, no, no. The only thing that works properly is actually transcendence. Right? And, and, the, and the second best, the functional thing is the mode of goodness, that's Dharma. The moment you step below that, you, you're guaranteed to have problems, even if it's not in the short term, in the longer term. Yeah? Now when you see someone, and this is really important, when you see someone doing something wrong consistently and they seem to get away with it, it's not that they're getting away with it. What's happened is, in their previous life they acted properly. And in earlier points in this life, they acted properly. And there's a time lag between action and reaction. Okay, so someone acted properly, sattvic, proper behavior earlier in this life. Now they're cheating, lying, stealing, conniving, um, playing politics. And they seem to be getting away with it now. But no, they're getting the reaction now to their pious behavior previously. So what you're seeing now is the reaction to previous piety. At the same time, in the present moment, they've done all this conniving, crafty stuff. So in the longer term, what's going to happen to them? They react get a reaction. It's just time delayed. It's important to see through the eyes of Shastra, otherwise people who are simple-minded, people who are not scientific, they think that the, the good people, nothing works for them. So therefore, in the, in the short term, you think, well, I, I want to be good, but I look around and say, oh, they're good, and they have all these problems, and they're good, and all these bad things happen, so maybe I shouldn't be good. No, you should be good. Of course, you shouldn't be sentimental, that's different. And often, devotees do not know the difference. Sentimental means you recognize the reality of the situation and you act accordingly. Senti sentiment means that your love is not strong. And that's the real problem. The truth of the matter is, our love is not very strong. So unless I think you're an angel, I can't actually love you. Right? Unless I think you're perfect, I can't actually love you. I can't say, actually, you know what? They sometimes, they sometimes are a bit devious. They're still my brother and sister in Christian consciousness, but sometimes the behavior, not they, the behavior is sometimes not ideal. But I love them anyway. Right? That's actually the standard, because then you, you see them for who they are. You, you know how the, how the person has come. You see them for who they are, and you still lovingly encourage them to improve. Do you think that Prabhupada couldn't see his disciples? Do you really think that Prabhupada was, in, was, was blind to the issues of his disciples? Do you think that? Do you, and do you think that Prabhupada didn't love them? No. That's the reality. Right. So it's meant to be both. It's interesting that it's explained in our Shastra that the mother's love, it's, it's primary in the early years. Right? Because it gives that unconditional love. That the, 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 the affirmation or the mentality that it instills in the child is that you are unconditionally valuable. Right? It's not because you've done something, it's not because you've achieved something, it's not, it's not how much you have or how much you don't have. You are unconditionally valuable. End of. You don't become more valuable by your achievements, you do not become less valuable by your lack of achievement. Yeah? But then the father's love kicks in at a later stage. And the father's love is that love of, is the love that gives you a sense of responsibility and boundary. You're valuable unconditionally, but there's also other people on this planet. You're not the only person, right? It's not all about you. There are other people, and you have a responsibility to yourself and to others. So, in other words, mother's love says you're unconditionally valuable. Father's love says you're valuable, but everyone else is also. So you cannot demand things at the expense of other people. You understand? So when you see an individual who it's all about them. They had that, it's all about, they had that love, but they didn't get the boundaries. They didn't get that sense, of, no, but there are other people you're existing on this planet with. 
You have rights, but you also have responsibilities. Mother's love says you have rights. Right? You have needs there to be respected. Father's love says, yes, but you also have responsibilities because you don't exist in a vacuum. Other people also have needs. Other people also have certain um, things that they, can, that they deserve. So you can't claim your rights at the expense of another person. So where you have a modern society where there's an imbalance, that creates the problems. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. And that's what we see in many cases. Anyway, so the culture gets lost when people are sentimental. And, it's, and you'll become sentimental. This is really important. You can tell when Maya's going to attack you if you're honest with yourself. It's very simple. It's not, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. No, no. It's very simple. Where are you weak in Krishna consciousness? Bus. Right? If, you, if you're honest with yourself and you understand, where am I weak in Krishna consciousness? That's when Maya's going to attack you. For some devotees, the thing is, you love being by yourself in Krishna consciousness. Because in your previous life, you were a yogi. So when you came in, the spiritual practice, the sadhana, by yourself, you loved that. But associating with a community, oh my God. Right? Why are they still breathing? <laughs> Krishna, what's going on? You know, I'm practicing Hare Krishna and they're still alive. They have a Vaishnava, they're still alive. I've been living in the, in the temple for many years praying that the other devotees will somehow leave. Right? I don't mind you staying as a deity, but why, why, why these other devotees? You know, what, what, what good are they? Right? So because of your background as a yogi in a previous life, meditating by yourself in the Himalayas, you love being alone. And your biggest struggle is to just look another devotee in the face and smile and say, Hare Krishna. It's a real struggle. And the other devotees don't understand it. Because for them, that's easy. But for you, it is very, very, very hard. Another devotee, you like being a devotee, but you are so attached to your family. So every year, your mum sends you a little gift on your birthday, with a picture of you, saying it was so wonderful when we used to sit together around the table and have our, have our Christmas roast. Now you're vegetarian. I don't see you so much. You know, all your relatives are asking where you are. All of this kind of stuff, and and, and you feel you're ready, but you're about ready to put your beads down and run back to mummy. Right? You're still a mummy's boy or mummy's girl. And again, many people don't understand it. For someone else, your attract is sex. Right? You can practice all of it, but there's just that member of the opposite sex who looks at you a certain way and you're about ready to melt down. So you should be honest. Or for someone else's money, right? You're, you don't mind the devotee, it's good, but when it comes, because you're attached to money or facility or resources, you will cheat devotees. When it, when, see, the trick is, everyone has a priogena, right? Everyone has a priogena. You have a goal, a psychological priogena. And when there's no competition between Serving Krishna and that priogena that you have an attachment to, everything's fine. But when a situation comes where it's between doing the right thing to serve Krishna and gaining something that you're attached to materially, you, unless you're in good association, unless you're very sincere, you will choose the material over the spiritual and, and you will also create your own philosophy to justify cheating. Has anyone seen that happen? We've all seen it happen. Yeah, some people don't like this class because it's just very, it's very non-sentimental, but tough. That's what happens, right? So some people do that and they'll try and create a philosophy. Oh, well, you know, uh, there's a higher purpose and it's about the preaching. No, you wanted the facility. You're a cheat. You have a che there's a cheating tendency here, right? That doesn't mean that the person isn't a Vaishnava, but here, scientifically, there's a cheating tendency here. And you should be aware of that. And we all have that. In previous ages, you had the good and the bad living, existing in different universes. As the ages went down, then you had the good and the bad living on different planets in the same universe. As it went down, then you had the, the good living in one continent or one landmass, the bad living in another mass. Right? Then as it went down, you had the good and the bad in the same family. 
In Kali Yuga, it gets worse. In Kali Yuga, you have the good and the bad living or existing in the same person. Okay? Existing literally in the same person. So you always get confused about, but the person's so nice. How could they do this? You know, so Chanakya explains that. He says people can act differently according to different relationships. Right? That's why, and I see the devotees get confused, but, but they're so nice to Guru Maharaj. Yeah, because that's Guru Maharaj. It doesn't mean they're going to be nice to you. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah? Seriously. But it's not fake. They really do love Guru Maharaj. Of course it's Kanishta. Kanishta love means I can do the right thing when the person's present, but I can't follow the person's instruction when they're not present. Right? So there's a letter of the law and there's a spirit of the law. I can serve the order of my guru, but the spirit of the, of the guru, the, the, the mood of the guru, that means act properly with all Vaishnavas. I can't do that. Right? I can do the right thing towards Guru Maharaj because I want Guru Maharaj to smile at me and tell me how wonderful I am. But you guys, you're not going to do anything for me, so I can stab you guys in the back. It's okay. Right? And because it's Kanishta, I don't see the contradiction. I don't see that my spiritual master actually is a representative of the super soul. I don't see that the super soul is actually present in the heart of every living entity. It's not just that the deity is Krishna, Krishna is carried by the devotees. I don't get that. Right? So I don't, I'm not advanced enough to understand that when I'm attacking or mistreating the devotees, I'm also damaging my relationship with my spiritual master as well. I don't get that. Because it's Prakrita Bhakta. Prakrita means material, materialistic. Prabhupada translates in one place, materialistic devotee. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he talks about the Bahir Mukhya Shisha. Right? You understand that? Now think about the terminology. If you, if you look into the etymology, the meaning of the words in Krishna consciousness, you can uncover a whole new universe of deeper understanding. So, we have different energies. Bahiranga, what kind of energy is that? It is the external, right? So Bahir, Bahiranga. Then you have Antaranga. Antaranga is what type of energy? Internal, right? Antaranga Shakti. Tatashtra is the marginal energy. So, Bhakti Notako talks about the Bahi Mukhishisha and the Anta Mukhishisha, right? So Bahi Mukhishisha is a type of disciple and he says Mukhi means face, right? Bahi means external facing, right? So you see that in the Kanishta Adhikai, it's all about the externals. Someone's got a big house, oh my god, they must be a pure devotee, right? Really? Right? It's all about the externals and, and actually it is a stage that everyone goes through where people become enamored so much by externals because they are Bahi Mukhishishas, external facing devotees. Then you have the more advanced Anta Mukhishishas. So they are internal. So when they're internal, when we become more advanced, we genuinely appreciate the actual deeper qualities of an individual. Yeah? And the majority of devotees are what? Kanishtas or above? What do you think? Kanishta Adhikaras. Oh, the devotees are so much into it. Yeah, because they're Kanishta Adhikaras. It's a stage that everyone goes through, so don't be surprised. This is scientific understanding of Krishna consciousness. Huh? Krishna wants you, and I'm, and I'm saying this again, Krishna wants you to understand things scientifically and to act accordingly. Many of you in this room, you will have been upset in the association of devotees, and actually, you know what? It's your own fault. It sounds harsh, but I mean it. It's your own fault because you don't accept what Krishna is telling you through the scriptures. Right? Krishna is saying, devotees will be at different stages. You should understand that and you should act accordingly. In other words, if, we're, if you're sentimental and you get your, your hands burned, it's your own fault. It's not Krishna's, oh, but did Krishna, why did Krishna allow this stuff? No, he told you, dude. The person's a serial thief. I know he wears tea light, but dude, don't give him your ads, don't give him your credit card details. You know? Love him. Yes, it's good he's chanting Hare Krishna. He will move, he will change because the purification of the process is so powerful. But don't give him your credit card details. And please don't give him your PIN number. You get it? That's scientific um, application of Krishna consciousness. You are meant to know every single person that you are interacting with. You are meant to understand how to deal with them scientifically and you're meant to love them in spite of their faults. That's hard work. 
But that is the scientific expectation of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sri the Prabhupada, and all of our acharyas. You understand that point? And that's how we develop a culture. The other aspect of culture is protection. Right? This civil disobedience is the Lord showing that I'm in charge, you come with me, we will get what needs to get done. Right? And when people aren't protected, it becomes ins people become insecure and the society becomes animalistic. We're meant to protect each other. That means, in other words, when you've had a tough time, you need to know that I'm going to be here to support you. If you think that the moment that you can't um, you know, bring in I don't know, um, money or resources, that we're going we're gonna, to um, stab you in the back and turn away, that's going to give you, that's going to put even more pressure on the devotees in our community to play games and to be pretentious and to pretend. And we don't want that. We want people to be real and therefore we have a responsibility to create that type of culture where people can be honest and flourish. And to put their hands and say, Prabhu, I'm struggling. I need your help. And everyone's like, yeah, I am my brothers and sisters keeper. And that will do everything for this movement. Yeah? Otherwise, it becomes degenerative. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah? That's the point. And don't look to anyone else to do this. This Krishna consciousness movement, it's your movement. Okay? Be very clear on that. If you have that mentality that it's someone else's job, you will actually become disempowered and you'll do nothing. And Maya loves that. That, that kind of, vic oh, I'm a victim. Oh, they didn't do this for me. Oh, they didn't do that for me. Okay, but what did you do? And how did you try to make the situation better? Yeah? So don't become a victim. Use your common sense. Use your brain in, in Krishna consciousness. And deal properly and set the example that you want to see for others. Hmm? And the more we do that, the kind of blessings you get is crazy. It's, to be honest, it's off the scale. Right? Because it's not easy. Right? It's not easy. In Kali Yuga, to have integrity is not easy. Right? But it's extremely potent. Right? Extremely potent. One of, the, one of the greatest blessings that you can experience in your lives as devotees is to be able to go to sleep every night knowing that you did the right thing. You understand? It gives you a certain type of inner strength, a certain type of power, a certain type of shakti that you cannot get anywhere else. And, when, and see, the trick is when you, when you deviate, when you treat people unfairly, when you cheat people, you're cheating yourself. Because Krishna takes note and he says, okay, you're going to have to pay for that later on. And deep down, it erodes your sense of, of self-strength. Self because you know, really, to be honest, I shouldn't have actually said that to that person. Right? I may have tricked other people to let them believe that it was okay, but to be honest, when I look at it deep down, that was cheating, that was wrong. And I know it. And you know the way you know it? Because the super soul says to you, you know what? Do you think that was actually, do you think that was actually the right thing to do to that person? Just, just between you and I. No one else is here. Just tell me honestly, do you, do you really think that that was what your spiritual master, Shiva Prabhupada, Radha and Krishna, that, do you think that that's what we actually wanted you to do? Right? And you know deep down, I shouldn't have done that. Right? So that's the point. It's not, oh, you know, they didn't, they didn't, no, no, people didn't tell me off or not. It, it, don't worry about that. That's for children. It's between you and Krishna. You actually, we, we actually carry a culture within our hearts. And then that culture that you develop in your heart, it expands outwards in your association. So if you want to be strong, if you want to get unlimited blessings, if you want to be a powerful person who's experiencing all kinds of amazing miracles on a day-to-day -day basis in your spiritual life, do the right thing, dude. And don't, and don't be under any illusion that people who do the wrong thing, that somehow it's okay. It's just a question of time that the reaction comes. Okay? The powerful thing, the powerful thing is the person who has the integrity to act properly. Huh? According to time, place and circumstance. Yeah? Okay, so we'll stop there. Shri Chaitanya Charitamrita Ki Jai. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Janita Gopramanandi. Okay. Okay. So we stop there or do we have time for questions? How do you want to do it? Okay, I think everyone's going to want to have breakfast, which is understandable. But um, yes, you have your hands up.
Thank you for the talk. Mm, um, thank you. About doing the right thing. Um, yeah. Well, we should always try and do the right thing, especially when we see all how we have in our interactions with devotees. Um, what if we have some envy toward the devotee, mm -hmm. and because of that envy, the way we treat that devotee, or speak to that devotee, or think about that devotee, mm -hmm. it doesn't become what we do is right. It's, yeah. it's, like, it's like we know what we want to do, that which is the right thing, but yeah. because there's an overpowering envy, yeah. um, that it's hard to do the right thing. Of course, and that happens all the time. The first thing we have to be, do is be honest, humble, you know? There's, is there envy in my heart? Yes. Right, so why is it? So Chanakya says a friend can be, a, you can tell a friend in adversity, right? It's, it's, a, it's a psychological principle that when you're in difficulty, the people who actually come to help you, they're your actual friends. People who are neutral, and, and especially people who kind of go in the other direction, they're not actually your friends. Chanakya explains that. Because in the situation where you're, where you're in adversity, there's nothing to gain from you at that time. So now it's just you bare naked and, and then people are interacting with you alone. Not, not some kind of game. So when people don't do that, yeah, there's loads of envy. And the first thing we should do is recognize that we are envious and then work on it. Sometimes it's advised that you serve the person that you're envious of. Yeah? But we should also recognize that if we don't work on our envy, that envy will also cause us to do other things which will damage us in the, in the longer term. Because envy itself is of a certain mode. Envy is actually the mode of ignorance. Jealousy is the mode of passion, they're different. And appreciation is the mode of goodness. Envy means I want what someone else has, right? So that means I, wa I want at your expense. I want to take, you've got it, but I want to take yours. Jealousy is more competitive. You can keep it, but I want to outdo you. That's jealousy, right? And appreciation is I appreciate what you have and what you've done, yeah? So these are, they have modes. Now what happens is, if you cultivate a certain emotion, it floods your consciousness with that particular mode. What, see, the truth is, no one's seeing the world as it is, unless they're very pure. What actually happens is you see the world through your heart. So if there's a lot of anatas in the heart, it, falls, it, it, it actually acts as a filter. You can't see the world properly because you can't see the people properly either. So if I have envy towards someone, I have to play up their bad qualities and play down their good qualities because that, that way I can exist around them. So they didn't, re they, they didn't really work very hard. You know, they're lazy. You know, I play, I play down their good qualities because then I can feel better about myself having a negative emotion towards them. You see the point? But the truth is, they may not be like that at all. The other thing is, when you, when you contact a certain mode, it blinds you, and just like you're walking, you're, let's say you're walking in a place where there's landmines, but now you're blinded, you can't see the landmines, so you're bound to do and say something that's gonna cause more difficulty in your life. The modes actually have a blinding quality. So the mode of ignorance literally means it floods your consciousness with ignorance. You can't see the devotees, you can't understand the devotees, you can't understand the devotional process, and that blindness will cause you to do and act in ways which will ultimately lead to your destruction. Think about it. it we see this again and again in the Shastra. So even Duryodhan and, and you know, the Kauravas, they should have actually had enough common sense to know you're dealing with Mahabhagavats. And, and Krishna's there. How can you possibly think that you're going to get away with it? Karna should have been... Should have been wise enough to know. Krishna told him, look, Yudhisthira is your brother. He's Dharmaraj. He's so dharmic that if you go and tell him that you're, that you're brothers, he will step down and give you the entire kingdom. Dude, what's going on here? Right? But Khan is so blinded, no, I still have to, I, I, I know that, and I know it's true, but I, I still want to fight against him. His envy towards Arjuna in particular was so strong, it blinded him. So what happens is it blinds you, will then say and do things and make decisions which will ultimately lead to your destruction. Krishna doesn't have to trip you up. The modes cover you and there you, and there you will trip yourself up. Yeah? So the, the point that was explained about the Kauravas and the, and the Pandavas, very interesting point. They were both royal family. Think about it. So they both had tremendous piety. It wasn't that, oh, you know, one's demoniac birth. No, they're royal family. I mean, that means, dude, that means they've done a lot of pious deeds, right? Royalty, royalty. Krishna interacts with them. He speaks to them. The supreme personality. You have so much credit. 
the supreme personality of Godhead interacts with you and speaks to you directly. That's serious. It's serious. But the difference is the directions that they were going in. Right? The Pandavas, by their proper behavior, their, their condition was going up constantly. Even if it seemed like it was going down, by their piety it was going up. The Kauravas, they were losing all of their pious credits. Yeah? In Kali Yuga, you will see something very amazing happen. And I'll stop on, I'll, I'll end on this point. In Kali Yuga, in the scriptures, it talks about so many, uh, uh, so many low-born individuals, right? So many platforms, low, and, and it's real. But what you'll see is, in Kali Yuga, those who are low-born, if they have the humility of recognizing I'm fallen, they will be elevated. And those who are seemingly high-born, if they become proud of their so-called high birth, they will become fallen. Hmm? Krishna, through the, through the emblem of Haridas Thakur and others, he wants to show, I don't really care about your, your starting point. I care about the direction you're, you're driving in. You understand? So that's the difference. And that, if you study Shastra very carefully, you'll see constantly these patterns, right? Core of us, high birth, low consciousness, they're going down. Someone else, low born, Haridas Thakur, high consciousness, always going up. Right? It's not where you're born, it's not your situation, it's the direction of, that your consciousness is taking you in. So anyway, we should serve those who we have some envy towards, we should recognize that envy, we should lament or feel sad that we have that envy. And we should try to continually practice our devotional service in good association to actually become free of that envy. Because in time that envy will lead us to make decisions which will ultimately cause us suffering. Ignorance leads to suffering. Make sense? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't want to hold you guys back from breakfast. Shri Chaitanya Charitamrita Ki Jai, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Janita Gopramanandi Hari Hari Bo.